Police costs for the more than 300 municipalities serviced by the Ontario Provincial Police have been increasing rapidly. Although many are satisfied with the quality of service, some say that cost is simply becoming unaffordable. Joining us now for more in Cochrane, Ontario, via Skype, Peter Politis. He is the mayor of Cochrane. And with us here in studio, Rick Philbin, commander of the OPP Municipal Policing Bureau, Christian Leuprecht, political science professor at Royal Military College and Queen's University, and Linda Thompson. She is the mayor of Port Hope, about an hour east of Toronto. And Peter Politis, we're happy to have you on the program again. Just saw you last week on the spring bear hunt. And to our friends here in the studio, thank you for coming in as well. Peter, I want to start with you. Uh, I'd like to know what the situation is like in Cochrane, and in particular, how the costs of policing have changed over the past decade. Well, the costs of policing are dramatic in Cochrane, and it's no different than the most of the province, uh, to be frank with you. In Cochrane, for example, policing costs have uh, doubled in the past five years, and uh, that doubling is equivalent to about a 25% tax hike in the community. And if we continue on this trend, in the next couple of years, our policing costs will have triple. It is the single biggest cost uh, that we're dealing with on our tax levy. And we started out uh, uh, two years ago with this being 50 cents to of every tax dollar collected in Cochrane. So it's dramatic. And I do want to frame, though, that uh, the service is fabulous. We have no issue with the service. We think the service is second to none. It's a matter of recognizing the unsustainable nature of the cost and finding a way to deal with that. Mayor Thompson, what's happened in your community? Well, we're very lucky. We have two police forces. We have uh, the OPP in the rural area and the municipal police force. Policing costs are a huge portion of our budget. Uh, they're continually to increase, and uh, with our municipal force, we're always looking at ways to control that, uh, reducing officers, etc. On the OPP side, it's really uh, being very carefully on, on that contract and how many officers are allocated and uh, how we can better manage it because the costs are a huge portion of Explain this to me. Why do you have two police forces? <laughs> we are an amalgamated community. We have a fabulous small heritage downtown and, and urban area. Uh, we have a much larger rural area that was policed by the OPP and a municipal force, a, a long-standing uh, municipal force in the urban area, the former town. Uh, once we amalgamated, the residents in the urban area loved their municipal police force. It's, they're, they're very passionate about their police. We have gone through six policing studies in 13 years. Um, each time it's recognized that there are savings that uh, could be had if we went all OPP into an integrated police service. But the reality is people in the urban area love their police and they, they stood behind them and they have and they want to uh, maintain that service. So they're content to pay more in order to have the two different services? They told us that during the policing debates, they were willing to pay more. At tax time, it's not, not quite so much. the same. Is there a difference in the quality or level of service you get between the local force and the Ontario force? They are both fabulous police forces, and the officers work together and share services. Um, it's often thought you have more control with the municipal force. That's really not true. You work under the Police Services Act and you manage accordingly under that act and the same uh, conditions apply. So, uh, but we have different levels of service. The OPP provide us a rural level of service. Um, Which means what? Um, it, we have a farm community. It's much different than the urban center with uh, downtown patrols, large commercial areas, those types of things. So it's a different type of, of policing in the urban area. Um, I know the OPP do that type of service in other communities, uh, but that's not what we have contract with them. Okay. Um, Rick Philbin, help us understand this. Why have policing costs gone up as much as they apparently have? Well, I can speak on behalf of the OPP. Uh, the, the costs for policing have gone up uh, over the past, uh, say, decade, uh, primarily because uh, for municipal, uh, for OPP municipally policed uh, locations, because uh, we're we are mandated under the Police Service Act to recover the cost of actual policing uh, for those municipalities. Um, and uh, since 2003, um, we've we've uh, uh, the, the contracts were established to recover the call the costs for policing, but the formulas failed to uh, stay with current uh, costs. I don't know what you're saying. What are you well, saying? What I'm saying is is that we we're building for work in 2010 with 2003 costs. 
So as municipalities uh, have been asking for updated costs, because at the end of the day, they, they're tired of, of seeing these skyrocketing costs every five years. So we've updated the formula to actually recover the actual cost of policing. That's what the Police Service Act tells us. So in 2010, when municipalities were going from 2003 costs to 2010, that was a significant increase in costs. So what we're doing is now uh, moving the cost towards full cost recovery. And that's where we find ourselves today. So that's, that's in, in essence, what's occurred. Full the cost recovery is a short way of saying we got to get our money fast, well, whether you like it or not. Well, we're, we're providing the service, mm -hmm. and in order for us to continue to provide that service that people are expecting from us, we have to, you know, from an operational perspective, we have to recover the cost. Got to recover your cost. In your view, what's going on here? Well, we have, we have costs that are going faster than, uh, than GDP. Uh, we have salaries for police and fire services uh, that are growing faster than the, in the, rest, of the uh, rest of the public sector. Why? And so it's an, it's an unsustainable, um, and I think everybody agrees that it's an unsustainable model. Um, one of the challenges is that the legislative constraints are such that there's relatively little maneuver for, uh, for police or for municipalities to gain efficiencies in and of themselves. Part of the reason why costs are going up is because 90% or upwards of 90% uh, of police budgets um, are salaries. And so it's just a very labor intensive, uh, in intensive effort. Um, but uh, we also need to ask questions about all the tasks that our police are actually carrying out. And it seems that to some extent, um, if we look over the last 100 years, the tasks that we expect police to do have expanded, uh, have expanded considerably. And, and police are becoming, in some cases, the social workers of last resort. And so whenever we don't know who to call, well, we'll call the cops. And the question is, if we have a highly trained, highly qualified, uh, well-educated and experienced officer who's making $100,000 a year, we need to ask questions about what sort of services do we want that individual to deliver? And are there perhaps ways that we can make sure we only call that particular individual for the task for which we need that type of service? Okay, let me get uh, Peter Politis back on the line from Cochrane. Uh, can you tell us whether you think that the police in your community are now being asked to do things today that they might not have been a decade ago, and that's one of the reasons why it's costing you so much more? I think Christian is right on the money. Uh, there are a lot of unsustainable trends here. That's one of them. Uh, when we're looking at the divestment with Steve Warren in the show last week talking about uh, bears and, and black bears and how they're managed, well, they've been divested to the police as well. It's a perfect example of something that doesn't belong in the hands of the police force. But the, when we look at uh, worldwide trends, this is not just a trend here in Ontario. This is a worldwide trend. There are whole cities in the U.S. going bankrupt over civil costs and policing being one of the highest ones. Uh, in the U.K., they're passing extraordinary legislation to try to manage that. In Canada, Ontario, proportionally, the municipalities are paying more for policing than anywhere else in the country. And yet the government still has moved forward with a, a notion that they have to make the OPP the highest paid police force in the country. So the costs are still continuing to go up, and the trends are still very, very, very concerning. Rick, as part of the issue here, the union has been extremely successful at getting high wage settlements out of the local municipalities? Well, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a sector-wide issue. It's certainly not just, uh, you know, Peter has indicated that the, uh, the mandate of the government is to have the, the OPP, the highest paid police service. That's, in, in fact, what it is, is uh, we're, the last agreement was, was uh, agreed that the, the OPP officers took a two-year wage freeze and then would uh, get exactly what uh, another police department at the top rate we're getting. So we're getting exactly what other police departments are getting. Uh, so, is it a problem? Absolutely. And, and, and I, you know, we've had, you know, the municipal sector wants us, or wants government to look at uh, interest arbitration. I believe that that is certainly something that they should look at. But I think it's the entire bargaining process that needs to be looked at. Uh, and that includes the municipal sector, because they are negotiating these contracts with their associations. Pick up on one aspect of that, Christian, the arbitration issue. Explain to our viewers what why that's an issue here. 
Uh, well, it's a, it's a challenge for municipalities in the sense that arbitrators currently don't need to take the ability to pay into account when they make settlements. And by and large, even though relatively few of these disputes actually go to arbitration, uh, the system is such that there's a, there's a very strong incentive for municipalities essentially to provide police with what they are, uh, is what they are asking for. One of the challenges that uh, uh, police have been very good at, um, at sort of equating policing with crime with community safety and response times. And one of the challenges is that the data actually don't s substantiate that, that there isn't a direct correlation between police complement and crime rates. Well, hold that. We're going to come back to that a little later, but I want to stick with the money. Do you, feel, as a mayor, do you feel pressure to give the police more of what they want? Because if it goes to an arbitrator yes. without consideration of an ability to pay, they may get even more. Absolutely, and we've seen that happen in our municipality. On the OPP side, I mean, we're looking at uh, the settlement, uh, the last settlement of 8.55%. It's going to cost... Over what period of time? Uh, that's um, the two-year freeze, and for uh, 2014, an 8.55% increase, as, as was noted. Uh, that costs municipalities $25 million. And that's not, that's just the baseline cost. There's additional costs on that. And the ability to pay for the taxpayer, uh, especially in smaller communities, is extremely hard. On the municipal side, we are seeing the exact same thing. Uh, arbitrators don't, uh, don't take into account the ability to pay, and uh, communities just cannot continue to sustain that. They don't take that into account. Peter Politis, I'm not going to ask you this question because you're a nominated, you're a progressive conservative nominated candidate in the next provincial election, and I know what your answer is going to be. But I'll ask Linda Thompson. The current government has been asked by Tim Hudak and the conservatives numerous times to make ability to pay part of the equation, Absolutely. and they haven't done it. Was that a mistake? Uh, they need to do it. They need to take that into account. Communities cannot continue to, to see this happening, and the leapfrog of effect of our, these arbitration awards are huge. We see that uh, with all of our services, fire and other emergency services too. I'm in negotiations right now with our local police force. They're a very dedicated bunch of individuals, but when you look at what's happening, you always have to consider what could happen if we go to arbitration. Should ability to pay be a factor in negotiations? That'll, that'll be an issue for our government to, to okay. consider. That's such a duck. What do you <laughs> think? Well, what do I think? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think ability to pay is certainly something that should be considered, but, uh, but it, isn't it should. It, well, it, it, absolutely. But I also, we also have to look at it from a holistic approach. I, I honestly believe that this is bigger than the arbitration process. There are municipalities out there negotiating contracts, freely negotiating contracts. Yes, in the in the in the shadows of this arbitration process, but they are negotiating. So I, I'm I'm personally, I believe that. Uh, this needs to be a holistic approach to the bargaining process for emergency services as we know them. Peter Politis, have you had any contract negotiations that ended up in an arbitrator's hands? Uh, yes, I mean, most of them end up in arbitrator's hands. If they don't end up in arbitrator's hands, the comments made earlier about how the, uh, this, the trend itself is there and people react to that trend. One of the points I wanted to address, though, Steve, was, um, and, and politely, obviously, is the, is the point around or the argument around that there was a two-year wage freeze for the OPP and somehow that's, uh, that's recognizing cost trends. There's a 14.5% increase in salaries associated with that collective bargaining agreement. Whether you spread it over four years, you do some in year one and some in year four, it's still 14.5%, and that's minimum because you're still waiting to see who the highest paid police force in the province is, and they're going to emulate that. And one question I would ask very politely, and it's a provocative one, but a polite one, is um, if you're looking at trends in police costs and you're talking about making them the highest paid police force or matching the highest paid police force, as municipal leaders, as people who are protecting the taxpayer's dollar, aren't we supposed to be emulating the lowest paid costs? Wouldn't that be the better trend set? Wouldn't that be the better direction to go in? Hmm. You want to answer that question? I didn't understand the question. Well, let's put it this way. If, if you want to be the highest paid force out there, um, which puts you on a par with whoever else is making the most money, which I assume is Ottawa or Toronto or something like that. Well, as of last week, it was Orangeville, Ontario. So. Is that so, right? Yeah. So. Orangeville's number one now. Yeah. How did that well, happen? Well, no, actually, well, 
Uh, you thought Newmarket. So there's, you know, Do you know Christian? So uh, the, the challenge is that it's not Toronto, it's not Durham, it's not Peel that's actually driving the costs. It's very small municipalities. Uh, that, that, so, so it's not actually cost of living, for instance, in a large urban center for police officers that's actually driving these costs. And the leapfrogging uh, okay. challenge, where essentially everybody has a benchmark that they're going to be in the top three or in the top five, means that every time somebody settles, all the, all the boats in the harbor essentially get lifted. And so it's very difficult difficult to overcome this leapfrogging, uh, the leapfrogging challenge. And so as a result, we have policing costs that increase by about 3.5% a year, which vastly outpaces GDP growth. Well, it reminds me of a situation of the pitcher for the Kansas City Royals who said, that guy from the New York Yankees is making 20 million bucks a year and you're only paying me eight. Mm -hmm. But of course, he plays in New York and you play in Kansas City. But you're not doing the same you might be doing the same function, but it, the circumstances are wildly different. Don't you have to take that into account with policing as well? Uh, the, the, the challenge is that in a larger city, you can somewhat compensate by, for instance, growing, um, increasing property taxes by virtue of so the value of property is going up and so you can collect more taxes. But it's the rural communities that get really hard hit because they have very limited, they, they have a lot of crown land, they have a lot of, sort of public buildings, so there's relatively little industry and other elements over which you can actually distribute this tax increase. And so what it means that for the vast majority of Ontarians, the, the largest portion of what's driving the increase in their property taxes is salaries for police and for firefighters. And this is, I think, something that much of the electorate doesn't actually understand when they listen to the, to the debates about how much their property taxes are going to go up. So, Peter Politis, what might fix this? I think we need to look at a better relationship between the municipalities and the province for Wednesday. Right now, it's a, we go to the door, get the black eye, collect the money for the province to provide their service. And what the Mayor's Coalition on Affordable Policing has been stating is we need a better partnership in municipalities. Uh, councillors and mayors are legally responsible for the money they collect from taxpayers. And right now, we have no way of controlling that money. So if we can't get that better partnership, and it's a choice the province needs to make, and we respect that, then our fallback to the province is then you need to pull it right out of our municipal budgets, like education, and you need to manage your service yourself. Because what's happening in our budgets right now, capital needs, seniors' needs, recreational needs, are all subsidizing policing costs. And Cochrane, for example, which has doubled and represents 50 cents of every tax dollar collected. 50 cents of every tax dollar collected in Cochrane goes to policing. Yes, it, it did uh, two years ago. We're down to about 30 cents right now, but we're still quite high, and we're, and we're working our way through this issue. But yes, that's how drastic this is. Hmm. Linda Thompson, what might fix this? Well, um, I think uh, we're looking at uh, legislative changes. They need to come forward. We need to have a better input, as, as was said. How can we have better input into controlling these costs? Some change to the provincial legislation and the Police Services Act and how we work together. Um, and looking at other cost savings and integrations. I mean, there are areas uh, crime is going down, uh, but that's because there is a lot of proactive policing, which is great. But how do we, how do we manage better? Um, we need to work with the province. Uh, we talk about the, uh, the uh, uh, negotiations with uh, OPP policing uh, wages. Um, the municipalities feel they have no input into that. So how can we have more input into what's happening and how can we have control over those expenses? And as, uh, as Peter said, how can we come to the table to work with the province to make this more efficient and more effective? So those are good questions. What's the answer? How can you? <laughs> how can you? Well, uh, there is a move forward to look at uh, changing the Police Services Act. Uh, AMO is working with a group to bring forward uh, recommendations on on how we can improve efficiencies of the policing. AMO um, is Association as, of Municipalities, municipalities of, Ontario. of Ontario. Yes, and um, things that we did with our municipal force, can we look at more integration of services? Um, the OPP do that now. How can, can we do it better? Um, when we look at the county, uh, that I'm in Northumberland County. There are seven, or I'm sorry, six contracts with the OPP for one detachment. So that's uh, six police services boards. So could we work together? It's again, it becomes a very political issue, and communities want to have their own control. Sure. But we need to work together, all of us, uh, local municipalities, along with the police, and the province has to come to the table to work with us. Rick Philbin, do the police see this as a problem? Absolutely. The OPP started on a, I, I would say on a path back in 2011 when about 21 or 22 mayors approached our minister, Minister Jim Bradley at the time, and, uh, and said, you know, the, the, the costs are unsustainable. Um, but more importantly at the time, they were saying that we don't understand the costs. 
that you're not transparent, the OVP are not transparent in how, how they bill for the service and how they come up with the FTEs in order to bill the service. FTEs? Uh, Full-time equivalent uh, uh, officers at the, at, the, at the local level. And, and, and when we, so, so we went back and we worked with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and we developed a, a, a working group to, to identify ways of better communicating with our partners. And then from that evolved, uh, really, that defined the problem. And also, we've, we, were, uh, we were audited by the Auditor General, and, and, and the Auditor General, they told us that your, the, cost, or the, the cost recovery from municipality uh, is, is so diverse. We've got municipalities paying as low as $9 per household, and some paying as high as $1,000 per household. And, and now that's, that's extreme. And, and we realize that, and so we then that's defining the problem. And, and now we've diagnosed it. We've looked at qualitative data. We've looked at we've we've uh, engaged with municipalities. But at the end of the day, you don't want the men and women of your service to be paid less than what they want to get. No, right? I honestly believe that we should be paid as as much as everybody else. I think we uh, that's my personal opinion, or so does our association. Uh, I think we do the same work, and that's that comes back to to what our uh, our worships are saying here. Integration works. Integration, the OPP, is is the the reason why we're half the price of every other police department in this province. And the integration we we police integration meaning what? Well, we police 324 municipalities, mm -hmm. and do pro provincial work out of 67 detachments. That's that's a basis of our organization. So when you look at, and we look at everything else that's going on in integration in healthcare, integration in, in, in economic development, that's, it's, it's a term, but we've been doing it for a long, long time. And that's, that's the reason for our success. The problem in the OPP is that we're billing people $9 per household and $1,000 per household. We gotta bring, bring people closer to the middle. And this is, what, that's, this is the diagnosis of the problem from an OPP perspective. Now it's a bigger issue because policing needs to look, the, the province has looked at this. They've created an, uh, the future policing advisory committee and they're asking for feedback. They're asking for, for, for the municipal sector to provide that, that input on the changes that are needed in order to come up with a more sustainable uh, police service. Okay, let me get Christian on this then. We, we, we've kind of laid out the problem here. We have an unsustainable situation. We have some vast differences. Some people paying nine bucks Per household for policing, others paying a thousand. In your view, is there a solution to be had here? I think we need to shift the debate from how much policing to what kind of policing we want. Part of it is we've done it to ourselves. As the <laughs> public, for instance, we expect very accountable police forces. So this requires a lot of paperwork and we have officers doing mountains of paperwork on grounds of accountability. Policing is much more complex today than it was 30 years ago. And so this requires a lot of resources and it requires, it's a highly complex job that requires very well paid, well-trained well individuals. But we need to ask ourselves whether the police should really be doing everything they are. On the overhead side, as was pointed out, there's only so many synergies to be had because it's a relatively small part of the budget. So can we actually have a discussion about what sort of services do we need the police to, to deliver? In only 3% of calls, is it actually a crime that is in progress? 80% of calls deal with things that are public order issues. They're not law enforcement issues. And yet people have sort of this tough cop sort of... For instance. Uh, this tough cop image. So for instance, burglary investigations. So do we really need an armed officer with a sidearm making $100,000 a year, taking uh, fingerprints, DNA evidence, conducting interviews? Um, a number of other jurisdictions have decided to civilianize those tasks at substantial savings. What does that mean? Um, it means that instead of having a uniformed officer show up, you have a civilian who is trained, for instance, in doing these tasks, everything from interviews to lifting fingerprints um, and, and, and a number of other sort of services that, uh, that folks deliver. Uh, who similar, may not be making 100000 a year. Um, who in many cases, for instance, Mesa, California is one such example um, of, of having civilianized those and th their cost savings are in the order of 40 to 50 percent. So it means you can effectively hire <laughs> two civilian investigators for the cost of, uh, of what one uniformed officer takes you. Let's follow up on that one angle. Would that, would that be something the OPP would go for? We're doing it. We've, we just hired uh, 100 uh, civilian data entry clerks in order to enter the data that our officers would typically be doing uh, on the side of the road or even driving back to the detachment in order to input the, uh, the reports into our, uh, into our data system. 
So that's, that's freeing up work for our officers. Now what we need to do is develop a system to, del to really know what those efficiencies mean. So I, I'm, you know, Christian is right on the money here. We, now we have to develop other areas and we have to look at other areas in the organization that we can civilianize or, and then as a result of finding efficiencies, maybe even then reducing our workforce. But that's, we need to do that from a holistic approach. And that, that's, we, we can, we can continuously use the OPP as the, as the battering ram to, to, to come up with these efficiencies and demonstrate that we're capable of doing it. We need to do it from a holistic approach at, at the uh, policing sector wide. Holistic approach means what? Every, everybody's doing it. Everybody's it's, it's, in. Everybody's into it. And this I wonder, is it because, if, oh, sorry. If, no, I was just going to say, if you, go, if you look for those savings, for example, in a huge force like the Toronto Police Service, that's one thing. Mayor Politis, how, how many, I mean, you've got a relatively small situation there, right? So even if you were to so-called civilianize things, can you really save very much money doing that where you are? Well, the, the, the rationale is that 10 to 15 percent is really the overhead associated with policing. The technology behind policing is amazing as it is. 10 to 15 percent is all we're playing with. We need to get out of the 10 to 15 percent and work into the 85 to 90 percent, which is what you're talking about, what the group is talking about right now. The challenge, though, and, and ironically, I think of it this way, and, I, and I'll tell you that I've been doing this for two and a half years, and the OPP has come miles away from where they were to where they are now, and they need to be commended for the work that they've done and where they are. But the challenge is, will the arbitration process and will the collective bargaining agreement allow us to get into the actual savings we need in that 85 to 90 percent, which is salaries? Is that something that's going to be feasible without legislative changes and without the government getting on board with those legislative changes? Rick Philbin, what's the answer to that? Well, you know, and Peter brings up a good point. We have worked better with, uh, with our municipal partners. But in order to come up with those savings, we're, we, need, we need legislative change. And I, and I, and Who's got to do that? That's a provincial Well, that's thing? a provincial government. But, but, but you know, it, it, when change happens, do you want it done to you or do you want to be part of the process? Sure. And uh, my, 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 my challenge, or, or the challenge for all municipal leaders in this case is, and, and you know, and uh, OPP municipality set aside, there's a whole host of municipal police departments and mayors and councils and police service board that have to get on board and come up with some some options mm -hmm. because you know we're always looking to you know and the the upper level of government yes they hold the cards they're the ones with the police service act but what is it what is it that you want the future policing advisory committee is that venue and and yes we're waiting to hear back on on reports but i you know i want to i, I my challenge to all the stakeholders is bring solutions and because in, in anything that we do, if we wait for it to be done to us, we're going to be criticizing process and we won't be dealing with the issue. Sure. Christian. And a number of these constraints are beyond the police force. So in the justice system, for instance, there are huge inefficiencies for the police force. Why are we having uniformed officers providing uh, transcripts uh, to the court system that really the court system should be paying for. They're all uh, the amount of time that officers spend in court, the amount of time that officers have to spend in court on overtime because of the way the court is scheduled. How often things get adjourned and the officer has to show up for a case time and again and often spends the entire day in court waiting for that particular issue then to finally come up. Yeah. So these are things that are beyond the control of the mayors, they're beyond the control of the police force. And so we need, we need to look, we need to have a much broader discussion about all the things that our police officers are doing and that are effectively subsidizing and where municipalities are effectively subsidizing provincial and federal services, which is who is delivering the court system and the, and, and the judicial system. Mayor Thompson. And, it, and when you talk about that, it's just not the Police Services Act that needs to change. Um, the Mental Health Act, the, uh, our police officers are dealing with a huge amount of mental health issues when you break down their calls. It's the courts, you know, we, we're paying those officers to spend an exorbitant amount of time doing crown briefs, etc. But on the street, uh, they're dealing with, as was pointed out, those uh, public order issues that in often cases, we know civilians can do that, but it's a matter of, of changing legislation and not just the Police Services Act. There's the Mental Health Act and many other areas uh, where there's no longer funding uh, in areas for mental health, so it falls to the street and it falls to the police officer on the street. With a few minutes left here, I want to put one more issue on the table and get your views on this because it sounds like a simple question, but I suspect the answer is a little more complicated. And uh, Christian, to you first on this. If a local municipality spends more on policing, will the crime rate go down? 
Well, we don't, that, the numbers don't correlate here. There's, uh, crime is a very complex issue. It's driven by a wide variety of factors, including, for instance, demographic trends. So as populations age and you have fewer young people and the economy does well and they all have jobs. So, uh, so to kind of associate police complement with crime is a spurious correlation. To associate uh, police complement and, and assume that faster response times somehow do something to help solve crime when in the vast majority of cases by the time police arrive, the criminal has long left the scene, again, is not really going to do much here. So we need to, I think, uh, and much of this is driven by popular culture. It's driven by, I think, a lot of, sort of the TV shows that, uh, uh, that we see, and that mm -hmm. also instills a sense of fear in people. You got something that, against TV? So that's, no, <laughs> never mind. Never mind that. Peter Politis, if you spend more on policing, does your crime rate go down in Cochrane? Well, I think Kristen mentioned earlier that the, the cost is being shortened by the rural communities. In rural Ontario, the, like in Cochrane, for example, the crime rate is 50, is half of the provincial average, yet our costs have doubled. So I guess the answer to that would be no, I don't think there's any correlation at all. The real issue here is municipalities and not having the control over those costs and accountability back to the taxpayer. And this relationship between the municipalities and the province needs to change. It needs to be a better partnership where the municipalities have some control. Quebec has a fabulous model that allows the municipalities more control of the costs and gets them involved rightly so in, in bringing accountability back to the taxpayers. What's the experience in Port Hope? You spend more, you get less crime? I would say absolutely. The uh, the community is spending more on police. We're trying to uh, drop down the, uh, you know, we've cut our, our communications, we've outsourced, we're doing all these things to reduce the cost, but our costs continue to go up and crime is going down. Uh, officers are spending uh, more time on, on the requirements in regards to legislation, what's required in court, and it's a different type of crime. Crime has no borders. Uh, and we're spending a lot of money on other types of, cr of crime. Last 30 seconds to you, Rick Philbin, on whether if you spend more on cops, the crime rate goes down. No, I don't believe that. I believe that it's uh, in order to reduce crime. And, and it's, it's not about crime. It's about feeling safe in your house, feeling safe in your community. And when, and when you have a police service that's uh, focused on crime prevention strategies, law enforcement, and uh, you know, assistance to victims of crime, and uh, playing a leadership role in community safety. And I know that sounds odd, we should be taking one, but it, I, I believe that it's, it's a, uh, the community plays a huge part in, in, in this, in all social agencies. And, and I think that we should start looking at a different way of approaching community safety and, and not just dedicating it to police. And we thank all of you for coming in tonight and sharing your views on this, starting with Peter Politis, the mayor of Cochrane. It's good to have you on the program again. Linda Thompson, the mayor of Port Hope, Rick Philbin, the commander of the OPP Municipal Policing Bureau, and Christian Leuprecht from RMC and Queens. Good to have you all on the program tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.